I'm Duncan Fraser, Director of Useful and Kind Unlimited, a charity which aims to develop pro-social behaviour and leadership, especially with young people. Welcome to our podcast series, which aims to explore how being useful and kind to yourself, to others and to the world can make things better. Today, our theme focuses on one of the key issues facing us today, inequality, poverty, and the well-proven need for a new economy. Using our SO model, how can being useful and kind to self, others and the world address these massive issues and why does it take so long? Well, if anyone has the answers to these huge questions, it's definitely our guests today. Catherine Trebek is a Glasgow-based Australian writer, researcher and passionate advocate for economic system change. She co-founded the Wellbeing Economy Alliance and her brilliant book, The Economics of Arrival, co-authored with Jeremy Williams, is a powerful and persuasive and searingly logical debunking of the notion of economic growth. Catherine instigated the group of Wellbeing Economy Governments developed Oxfam's Humankind Index and is part of a range of important advisory groups. She's Senior Visiting Research Fellow at the University of Strathclyde and is a Distinguished Fellow of the Schumacher Institute. She has over eight years experience in various roles with Oxfam as a Senior Researcher for the Global Research Team, UK Policy Manager and Research and Policy Advisor for Oxfam Scotland. Welcome Catherine. Hi, Duncan. Great to be with you. Ben Phillips is the author of How to Fight Inequality, which is a seminal and powerful book on ways in which we can collectively fight inequality. Ben is co-founder of the Fight Inequality Alliance. He advises the UN, governments and civil society organisations. He was launch director of the Fight Inequality Alliance and campaigns and policy director for Oxfam and ActionAid International. He's lived and worked in four continents and a dozen cities. He's led programs and campaigns teams in Save the Children, the Children's Society, the Global Call to Action Against Poverty. He began his development work at the grassroots as a teacher and ANC activist living in a township in South Africa in 1994, just after the end of apartheid. He is also a Kellogg Institute Hewlett Fellow for Public Policy. Welcome, Ben. Thanks so much, Duncan. Great to be with you and great to be with Catherine. I have to tell you, though, Ben, <laughs> I did a, a Google search this morning on Ben Phillips bio. And the first thing that comes up, you'll be amused, is Ben Phillips net worth. <laughs> there's obviously there's some Canadian prankster who's obviously worth a whole ton of money. I thought you'd be amused by that. <laughs> there is, there is, there is. I mean, I hope that we can measure our net worth, not in, not in dollars, but in usefulness and kindness. Exactly. Fantastic. So um, you've said, Ben, inequality is the crisis of our time. The growing gap between a few at the top and the rest of society damages us all. I'm wondering when you both first realised that you had the chance in life to make a real difference to our thinking on inequality and injustice. Was there something early on in childhood, maybe, that triggered your interest? Ben? So um, my first moment, I remember it was at a, a Sunday school and we were given a game about how to trade and we didn't know, but the game had been created by some brilliant people at Christian Aid. So we were trading these, these shapes and you could cut out triangles or squares or various other things. And we all thought that the reason why some of us were winning and some of us were losing was that some of us were brilliant and deserved to win. <laughs> and some of us were just uh, too not smart enough or not working hard enough. And at the very end of the game, it was explained to us by our Sunday school teacher that in fact, the game had been rigged. And that what she was teaching us about was about the economy in which we lived. And that those of us uh, growing up in privilege in a leafy suburb in London were the beneficiaries, not just of hard work and effort and talent, but also the beneficiary of an unfair society that left others behind. And that this was morally wrong and left us all bereft of the, of the talents that we could harness 
of others. So that was a kind of a, a, a very early moment. And that was a, um, a part that really encouraged me to reflect on the type of society that I was living in. It was a kind of invitation to ask that question. So I'm really grateful to that Sunday school teacher and really grateful to the brilliant people at Christian Aid who created that game and to the activists who inspired them. I think you can talk with kids about this. My own kids who've got involved with Fridays for Future, have got involved with Black Lives Matter, because I think that often at a young age, people do ask the question, what's right, what's wrong, how can this be different? In some ways, the harder thing is to hold on to it. The harder thing is not to grow out of it. Um, so much is done to try to um, get kids to forget those lessons, um, to quiet them down, or to say that's just a phase that you went through. Um, and what I'd encourage all your listeners to do is to look back into their own childhood memory and to say, do you know what? That kid that was me, they, they were right. And to insist on, on holding on to that insistence on doing what's right. Fantastic. Thanks, Ben. We <clears throat> at Useful Encounter, we do a lot of that. So it's wonder wonderful to hear. Uh, Catherine, what was your trigger? You know, I don't know if there was one seminal moment that opened my eyes to the extent of inequality. I mean, similarly to Ben, I, I grew up in very you know, leafy suburbs of Australia, very fortunate existence. And when a way my, my sort of turnaround moment to really focus on the, the structural questions was when I just returned to the University of Melbourne from spending a bit of time living in Cameroon. And when I got back, I got notice that the little village I'd been working in had been decimated by a flood. And my first instinct was to jump on a plane and get back there to help because these were you know, friends of mine, folks I'd hung out with for, for the previous couple of months. And you know, it wasn't just charity ads on TV anymore. These, these were people I knew and cared about and had laughter and banter and conversation with. And luckily, I at, the, I at the time was taking a course in led by an incredible activist. Um, and the course was around human rights in Southeast Asia. And I mentioned this to her and that I was, you know, my instinct was to just jump on a plane and get back there and, I don't know, fill, fill sandbags or peel potatoes or something. And she, she sort of metaphorically slapped me on the wrist and said, you know, don't be so stupid. You'll, you'll just be a white girl getting in the way. You are here in a fortunate country with fortunate circumstances in university, get all the education that you can to attend to why that village was vulnerable to that flood and to attend to those structures. And now some 20 years on, her words still ring in my ears that sort of make the most of this fortune of birth, you know, that, that chance to get that education and to train my gaze and hopefully through conversation, those of others, of those upstream causes, the, the fact that if we don't, if we're not content just to look at the symptoms of the multiple crises facing the world and we dare to channel those sort of little kids in, the, in that Sunday school, you know, that kids that age are so often asking why, you know, yeah, but why, but why, you know, and often it's why do I have to go to bed or, you know, why is the moon up there or, you know, that, and that stage in that kids go through where they're always saying, yeah, why, why? If we channel our inner four-year-old and we ask why, you know, why were food banks in the UK rising prior to COVID? Why were levels of in-work poverty rising prior to COVID? Why is it that the Foreign Minister of Tuvalu was giving his, his COP press conference standing weights deep in, in water, in, you know, in the ocean, to make that point about rising sea levels? Why are they rising? And we ask that question, why? you so often find yourself facing our economic system. And of course, there's a whole lot of why behind the current economic system. But if we're to look at the way the economy is structured and who's winning and who's losing out of that, then we're really going to have to wrap our head around quite massive economic system change rather than just dealing with the symptoms. And important though that is, I don't want to denigrate folks who help people survive and cope with today and tomorrow because that I mean that is humanitarian work isn't it in the face of an inhumane system 
but we need to go beyond that and deal with the root causes. And so for me, that moment was having that conversation with that incredible lecturer, a woman called Jackie Sapano, uh, in and those corridors of the University of Melbourne some 20 years ago. Absolutely fascinating. And <clears throat> this why question, I think, is going to in, inform our talk a lot. Uh, one question that we ask at Useful and Kind a lot is, so why when we know it, don't we do it? And obviously that's a theme, but I just want to explore something that particularly comes out of Ben's book, which is we're obviously passionate about trying to develop pro-social behavior and leadership. And fortunately now there's a ton of neuroscience and anthropology and all the rest of it around that. But the thing I'm interested in is the positive disruptors in history, be they abolitionists, suffragettes, LGBTQI plus campaigners, make poverty history, extinction rebellion, they've all worked together. And that's a, a really powerful theme of your book, Ben. Yet we live in the age of the individual. I'm just wondering for you both how we square this tricky circle. I think, Duncan, it's not a coincidence that we live in the age of the individual. That's the plan. Um, ordinary people, um, which means working class people and middle class people, are never powerful on their own. I want to repeat that. They're never powerful on their own. Now, if you're a billionaire, you can be powerful on your own. Because we've reached a level of wealth with some people where they don't just buy yachts. They buy elections. They buy media houses. They buy legal impunity. They buy the ability to shape the rule of law. In fact, they even can buy the ability to help shape norms, to help shape what we see as okay or not okay. But ordinary people, we're only ever powerful in collective. When I went back and I looked at the history of when had inequality been successfully tackled, it always required popular pressure. And that popular pressure always required what I call a super majority. You needed groups and you needed groups of groups and you needed a whole range of, of, of forces, what the Reverend William Barber calls fusion coalitions, to come together in order to be able to succeed. Now, the best way for those in power to disrupt that is not primarily through the um, uh, egregious, obvious naked use of force. Um, that can be used, it often is used, but it's kind of a failing strategy. Once they're onto that place, they're in a difficult place. A much more effective way for them to maintain this dysfunctional society is to manipulate all of us into going along with it in some way. And one of the ways in which we're manipulated to go along with it is to believe that our best hope is to rise within it or to escape from it as individuals rather than to change it. So if we are to change it, one of the things we need to do is we need to become better at being allies, better at being what a friend of mine calls deuteragonist. A deuteragonist is the opposite of a protagonist. Often we're told we wanna to be the hero, we wanna be the main guy. But the deuteragonist, the buddy, the wingman, the assistant, the friend, the enabler, throughout history, these have been the people who don't say, what cause can I start, but find those who are already making a difference and ask them this question, how can I help? So that is how change has been brought about throughout history. I'm an optimist, not because I think that somehow technology is going to fix it for us, or that the market is going to self-correct, or that there is some teleological march of history towards progress. None of those things are true. And what's really sad about the economy is that we have a situation where inequality begets inequality. This is really, if, if Thomas Piketty's huge book, you don't have the time to read it, you wanna remember one thing, it's this. It's that, inequality left unintervened with will reproduce itself. And then the other thing that political scientists have pointed out is that wealth inequality generates power inequality and power inequality generates further wealth inequality. In other words, the very rich get very powerful and the very powerful shift the rules to make them even richer. So the natural tendency, if we don't interrupt, is in fact that things will get worse. The reason why I have hope 
is because of all of us. I, I, the, the, overwhelmingly, people's moral sense is broadly right. And so if enough of us can get together and we can learn to work together well, then it is possible for us to reshape and um, unmake these man-made uh, injustices. We can humanly unmake them and build something fairer. So that's our, that's our possibility. But individualism is a really dangerous thing. And what that shows is this ideology or force that we call neoliberalism, which is the one that since about 1975 or 1980 has dominated the world, a particularly extreme form of capitalism, a kind of um, uh, capitalist extremism, if you like, a militant capitalism, a capitalist fundamentalism, mm -hmm. that that force hasn't just privatized basic services, hasn't just hurt the economy hasn't just destroyed the environment, but has also affected us. It's seeped into our pores. And so part of the process of a collective liberation is for us to, is for us to look within and for us to question that individualism and start to practice habits of being a buddy, of being an ally. And here's one good tip that a friend of mine taught me. She said, if you want someone to join your cause, to be alongside your cause, don't ask them yet. Go along with their cause, help what they're trying to do. And then later on, they will ask you, how can I help you? And I think if we, if we cultivate those types of practices, it's through that that we have the potential to generate the type of change we need for a fairer society. So can, can I pick up on a couple Please. of a couple of Ben's points? Because there's a few things I want to just, I mean, a lot of it, but a lot I want to just particularly un underline. And, and this, I think, pernicious mantra of individualism, not just in terms of, you know, this incredible individual seizing against the odds and, and you know, the whole, it's up to you uh, individually to make your own success and all the myths that are surrounded by that and this and that social mobility agenda that that you touched on Ben and just you know that we can't even hope to change those unequal structures that the best we can hope for is to stand on the shoulders of others or climb climb out of the pit uh, that that is presumably the best that that we're offered but I also think it's it has parallels also on where blame lands and I'm thinking one example particularly around the framing of the Australian bushfires about almost two years ago and in, in, in certain media outlets owned by a certain very powerful individual who is a classic example of having financial wealth and using that to rig the rules of the game in, in his favour, his media outlets were laying the blame fairly squarely at the feet of arsonists. Now it may have been a couple of arsonists that lit the match but that doesn't explain the dynamics behind why Australia was coming out of one of the worst droughts in decades and why the country was so incredibly dry and why the fire spread so incredibly fast to the extent it did. And then in contrast to that, what was it? It wasn't a few heroic individuals on their own fighting the fires. It was thousands of volunteers who came out of their businesses and their homes and their villages and their towns to fight those fires collectively. And I'm going to be a bit heretical here because there, there's this mantra that folks in the social justice movement like to say, and it's a quote from an incredible anthropologist, I think she's Margaret, Margaret Wheatley, and she says, never doubt that you know change can come from a small band of individuals because that's only what's ever happened. And actually, I, I think that's wrong. I, I completely agree with Ben, actually. It create it requires bigger movements than just small individuals. Now, of course, they might be catalyzed and inspired by one or two individuals. And I think the Fridays for the Future movement is a good example of that. Now, Greta on her own would not have been enough, but she inspired thousands and thousands and thousands of people around the world 
to come out and to say to their political leaders enough of this recalcitrance that I think has moved the agenda on dramatically over the last few years. But it certainly wasn't Greta on her own. It was those who stood up to do as Ben's described, to stand alongside her, to say, how can I help? And I think just that moving away from even thinking about individuals as solutions to our problem, but also understanding that it's not just individuals that are the cause of our problems. These are systems dynamics and sadly that's more complicated in terms of wrapping our heads around the change that needs to happen there's no simple one silver bullet to change some of those dynamics or to unlock the mechanisms what we need to do is such a I, I often talk about the jigsaw puzzle of changes that are required fortunately there are people who are putting their shoulder behind various pieces of those jigsaw puzzles but none of them on their own are sufficient they're all necessary collectively but not sufficient on their own Okay, brilliant. I want to be equally heretical. Um, I wonder if the Oxfam wonderful line about six people own X billion <clears throat> has actually got in the way for some people who go, well, it's the problem is with the six. Um, just to put that in context, you know, we've now got 20 years at least of research about how uh, money simply doesn't make us happy it's if if it does at all it's the differentiator uh it's experiences and quality relationships and all the stuff we all know um i think our sense is that and ben ben talks about this in 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 that wonderful line of the imbalance between those at the very top and the rest of us means that to lift up the have nots, then we'll have to let down the have yachts. And this uh, this sense of, for me, being a kind of psychotherapist as well, my feeling is that the surrounding and the accretion of wealth in monetary terms is a defense against unmet childhood needs. And that our society and our economy has rewarded that sense. The idiocy of it being that, of course, it's not true, but actually uh, you only have to look at a certain president of the United States uh, to see that absolutely that could be the case to convince himself that the love and approbation that was never there from a certain parent could somehow be mitigated by wealth. Now, if that is the case, then you can actually never in adulthood meet their unmet childhood needs. So I'm wondering about the powers of persuasion that we have. Do we focus there? Do we focus on the collective as we've talked about? And how do we do that? What are your thoughts, Catherine? So one, one I think, insight to the, the sort of dynamics that you're pointing to there it comes from one of my favorite scholars a chap called Tim Kasser who's a psychologist just retired from Knox University in this in the states and he's written I think it was 2002 written fairly small little book called the high price of materialism and in a way I think he that book explains the why that our friends Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett almost touch on but don't quite get there in their incredible book that came a few years later that the spirit level where they talk about all the harm that economic inequality does to society and so what Tim does is he looks at how pervasive materialistic values are and the physiological consequences on individuals for holding more materialistic values to the extent of more tendency to narcissism, shorter relationships, more criminal tendencies, even physical manifestations of that, high levels of headaches, stomach aches, and so on. And he says that experiencing poverty in childhood in early years is a likely predictor of holding more materialistic values. And you can understand why because there's all this work around if you're lacking in something that's what you're trained to focus on um that the extent to which your bandwidth in your sort of your cognitive flow really focuses on what it is you're lacking and and living here in in glasgow which i you think you know it's a city that 
used to be the second biggest city of the empire. Now it's about big tagline over the last few decades is Britain's biggest shop, second biggest shopping destination. And I, I remember reading Tim Cass's work thinking I could go through and do a, a word replacement. Every time he has the word individual, I could put in the word Glasgow and you would see the very, very similar story. This is a city that's had the industrial guts ripped out of it. And in its place came this idea that the ideal citizen was a consumer citizen. And I think this city, because of its poverty and inequality, was profoundly vulnerable to those materialistic pressures. And we see, again, the manifestation of some of those dynamics in the extent of health inequalities here in, here in Glasgow. And so I think if we're going to wrap our heads around the, the pressures and the insecurity that come with poverty and inequality, we have to look at what it's like to participate in society. And... I mean, and the other the other point I want to make is around the the, you know, the idea of wealth. Apparently, in Old English, the original meaning for the word wealth was the conditions of well being. And if we unpack that and think about what are the conditions of well being, that things like relationships, decent shelter, sense of purpose, meaning, knowing that you and those you care about are safe. Now, often, if you don't have enough wealth in, in a financial sense then you're not going to be able to build those conditions. So wealth, financial wealth can be an input up to a point when you're, when you're lacking enough. But as you've said, Duncan, beyond that, wealth just is, helps us play that game of financial comparison, and that's a zero-sum game. Yeah. Ben, any thoughts? So I think there's two distinct, very, very important, but I would say distinct issues here. One is about the... Um, uh, the emotional, psychological uh, loss from inequality. And um, there's really important uh, findings about how in more unequal societies, you see, for example, lower trust levels. And one of the ways this is, um, you can see this mathematically, is that you can plot on a graph the proportion of people who work as private security guards against the levels of inequality. <laughs> But you can also plot it against um, the murder rate, the violent crime rate, um, the, um, even the teenage pregnancy rate and the obesity rate. There's something about a society that's stretched in that way that snaps. What we also find in a related way is that when you take away collective protections and collective provision, people will seek individual solutions and individual provision as a way to cushion themselves against it and after a time they will not even be able to imagine a collective answer so people will see for example potholed roads and all they can imagine is owning a four by four to be able to manage the potholed roads not that there wouldn't be potholed roads or they will see that um uh, there's either um, an absence of public transport or that if there is public transport, it's kept in traffic jams by huge numbers of cars. And their greatest hope is that they'll be one of those inside a car rather than that they'll be one of those who together with others could be in fast, rapid, high quality public transport that could get everybody to where they wanted to be. So these kind of individualistic answers, rather than clean tap water, let me have a, uh, uh, let, me, let me go to the shop and buy another um, uh, supply of, of water. These individual, individualistic answers, I saw them reach their kind of uh, height when I was living in Nairobi. And one of the things in Nairobi is you see how different people get to work. So the wealthy uh, get to work in uh, their cars with a driver. Now, I thought before I went there that the poor went to work in the Matatus, in the, in the private uh, big um, uh, combi taxis, private minibuses that people take. No, that's not the poor, that's the middle class. The poor walk to work. And so you have this very strange picture in Nairobi of a morning, if you're out at say six o'clock, you see some wealthy people, um, the small white minority, the expats and, 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 and others, um, some from the Kenyan elite, um, out jogging at six o'clock in the morning because it's their only exercise before a day in which they've driven around. And then you see walking, 
the masses of ordinary people going to work in other people's houses. Now, although they're walking, sometimes for an hour, they need to arrive looking good, looking spick and span. They will get blamed individually if they arrive with, say, dirty shoes or, 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 or washed out trousers. And yet they're having to walk through potholes and, and, and water. And when the road floods, because it hasn't been cared for, they can get wet. So what did I see? I saw this is the market solution to this crisis. The public solution would be buses, would be quality roads, would be drainage. The market solution is that hawkers who had a vegetable cart were charging people 20 shillings to get on the vegetable cart, to be traveled 10 meters, to sit on the vegetable cart like babies and to be carried 10 meters across a flooded patch of road in order that when they got to work, they, they, they would be looking like they were responsible, respectable people. And just the desperation of seeing this and how what, what kind of a dysfunctional society was created by inequality. So that's one part. The second part, though, that's really important is around how does change happen? Now, I think it's really important to say the question is not, are the rich bad? That's an unhelpful question. It's unhelpful partly because it's inaccurate, um, but it's also unhelpful because it makes us kind of desperate beggars appealing to them. Please be nice. Please be nice. <laughs> and yet the history is such. Martin Luther King said this. He said the unfortunate truth is that justice has never been given by the oppressor to the oppressed from guilt or from conscience. So sadly, the only answer, we, we need to stop asking, you know, can we have nicer rich people? We need to ask instead, how do we shift the balance of power so that the power of ordinary people, the power of the majority of people is greater than the power of a tiny minority of extremely wealthy people? I think that's the question. So though it is a dysfunctional society when a small number of people have such a huge amount of wealth, the answer to that is not to say to them, why are you so mean? The answer to that is for us to say to each other, why are we tolerating this? Why are we bending our backs? If we stand up straight together, they'll fall off. And that's the answer. And, and, and the history of social change is about how we all stand up together. So this brings us to what could be a massive topic, but let's just touch on it. Here we are the week after COP26. I'm wondering this very question about how do we make change? The classic in the environmental debate, you know, 20 years ago was you just produce a graph and no one will pay any attention. Do we persuade? Do we use behavioral economics? Do we nudge? Do we campaign? Do we legislate? Do we revolt? On that kind of continuum, I'm just wondering your personal experience of what's been most successful. Catherine. So, so the question around how does how does change come about is basically we need all of those activities, Duncan, because one will inform and enhance the other. And I have I have a very love, lovely memory that really sticks in my mind. Many years ago, I was doing some research with an enormous mining company in Australia, and I remember very clearly their head of sustainability saying to me that she would be able to have a conversation with. Some, I won't name names, but some of the more mainstream NG, environmental NGOs, she could bring them in house, she could get them in front of the board, she could really promote the conversation internally, because the more radical ones were outside with their placards outside corporate HQ, as the CEOs walked through so that that spectrum even there in that little microcosm of the slightly more radical one campaigning and shouting could prize open the door for others to then push the conversation and the ideal scenario is that it becomes a continuous sort of shunting up of ambition that you don't stop there with that first compromise you you keep going and I so I think and the, the thing is here with this multifaceted dynamics of change that we're going to require to bring about the shifts necessary we need people with all sorts of different skill sets so we need those who love 
being in a demo, speaking into a loud hailer, dancing about, blowing their whistles. We need those who are going to go inside the, the negotiation halls of the conferences and push and persuade doing that insider work. We need those who exist and work within those establishment organisations, the intrapreneurs, to build the coalitions internally to bring about change. But we also need those who are shouting outside and saying that is not yet good enough, keep going and holding their feet to the fire and keeping their ambition high. And the good thing is that that means there's a place for everyone. And I think one of the tasks for this economic system change movement that I think you know three of us here are all part of is to recognise the validity of all those contributions. I think one of the things that makes me so sad and, and does eat away at any optimism I, I may or may not have, depending on what day of the week it is, is the tendency to critique anyone who's standing at a different point on that spectrum without really recognising that all of those sorts of contributions are needed. And if we work together and recognise the value of each of those those positions on that spectrum that you outlined, that's how we'll bring, bring about change. And I think what I'd say so often to student groups when I'm speaking to them is, to find your niche. And so, so many people will, will gravitate to different spaces and just to celebrate that because that they all matter, all those different contributions matter. So I'm just wondering, the inevitable question that we ask ourselves is, how are we modeling it in our own lives? And linked to Catherine's word, how do we continue being hopeful when it's really Although things are getting better, it's still pretty dark. Ben, you give us your thoughts first. Well, I think we can be hopeful because we've beaten the seemingly impossible before. Um, we can be hopeful because we can remember the civil rights movement. We can remember the anti-slavery movement. We can remember the suffragettes. And not only can they inspire us by demonstrating that it's possible, but also they've given us this amazing guidebook, this amazing uh, route map to how to do it. And one of the key parts of it, and this I, I think is really important to emphasize, is about strengthening our collective power. We need to be concerned, not just with what is correct or incorrect, but with what is the balance of power the balance of power going into Glasgow was in favour of polluting fossil fuel companies and against ordinary people. And the outcome, the Glasgow documents, in a way, reflect that balance of power. So if you marched, you didn't fail because you weren't marching, you're not responsible for that document. By marching, by, by being part of, a, uh, by deciding to be part of a movement, what you started to do in doing that was to build the counter movement that when enough other people get involved, when it gets large enough, can start to tilt that balance of power. So that's where we find hope, but that's also where we find strategy. I wanna share a story about the Montgomery bus boycott, because this, mm. this is one of the stories that people remember, and the problem is we misremember it. And the misremembering um, sends us off in the wrong direction. It denies our own role, and, and, and strangely, it actually leaves us hopeless when we know the real story, we can be hopeful. Here's the full story. The full story goes like this. Black Americans were not allowed to be at the front of the bus until one day, one woman, Rosa Parks, decided to refuse to move. She refused to move. And then Martin Luther King gave an astonishing speech. And then it all changed. That's the version in public consciousness. It's totally false. First of all, Martin Luther King, who is a star, but he himself said, I am not in charge of this movement, the Montgomery bus boycott. And I didn't even plan it. It wasn't my idea. They just asked me to come here speak. He wasn't from Montgomery, he was from Atlanta. They just asked me to come here, give a speech. And Rosa Parks was not just one woman who one day decided to sit down and refuse to move. It had been planned by a group of African American women for two years before. And then for one year afterwards, for one year afterwards, they had to ensure that they could defeat economically the bus companies by not depending on them to get to work. They had to get thousands of people to work, which meant a massive cooperative effort. 
they had to know everyone who had a car, every black person, every sympathetic white person who had a car, and how they would be involved in, in pooling and in getting people to work in a carpool. They had to know, they had to plot the addresses. This is pre-computers and all that. So they had to do it on hand in paper. They worked with the postmen. All the postmen of Montgomery were involved because they knew all the street addresses. They could map where someone lived, where someone worked, and help plot the routes. It's every very, single it's... It's very interesting, Ben, because yep. every talk we ever give on Useful and Kind includes that story, the well, full good. story. And, and, because, and, yeah, you, sorry, and, one, and, one of the and, really important, one of the really important things for us is that Useful and Kind is not just kind. And we give the example of if Rosa knew what we do now about kindness and compassion and all the rest of it she'd know that she was angry she'd know that there's been all this preparation she'd know where it was in her body should she have stood up of course she should we believe that a lot of the kindness kindness and compassion and well-being stuff does not go far enough on the continuum that we're talking about so thanks so much for bringing Absolutely. our useful and, and, and kind and, story and crucially i would say what that story teaches us is that there wasn't one hero or two heroes, but there were thousands. thousands. The, the, the lawyer who led the case said, every single person in Montgomery achieved this. And what this says in terms of, in terms of a, a strategy and in terms of hope and our role is that if there is to be change, it will be because we get involved. And so instead of asking, where's our Rosa or where's our MLK, we need to remember that vital though they were, they were mainly expressions embodiments of much larger movements and yep. if we just help build that movement then the famous names will appear but what matters is that mass base without that mass base failure with that mass base success and that all that the whole range of roles that people took one of the ones i i talk about is the role that academics played because sometimes academics think oh my role is to be the genius my role is to be the expert guide but the most useful thing that academics did in the Montgomery Boss Co Co was this. Thousands of leaflets and posters needed to be printed. And this is before photocopiers. So it's this old printing machines, you know, the ones that you and I might have had at school that smell fantastic when, you, when, 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 it, when it comes out. And they had to roll them by hand. But the only places that had them were universities. So university staff at night risking their jobs, and some of them lost their job, printed these things. They literally got their hands dirty because it's that ink that sticks on your yeah. fingers. They literally got their hands dirty. That's how they helped to bring about change. And Fantastic. that's how we'll do it again. Thank you. Um, Catherine, coming to you, just how do you model it and how do you stay hopeful? Well, there's a big difference between modelling it and staying hopeful. And the older I, I get, the more I have had to sort of not beat myself up for the inconsistencies and to be honest the hypocrisies in in my own life the you know the contradictions and and do my best and something you you taught me duncan is is around you know is it is it good enough uh as opposed to is it enough and and so i we still live in this current paradigm so we cannot live the perfect life uh i know i haven't been good enough friends to people when needed i know i probably made bad choices with how I spend my time. I probably do say yes to too many things and then don't deliver a good job at them when I should be saying no and doing better job at a few of them. I know I try my best to be low impact on the environment, but I tell you what, I'll be completely honest, I can't wait to get on a plane to go home to see my family in Australia. It's been so long. And, but I, I do, so I do as much as where else I can in, in other aspects of, of my life in a practical sense. But I think if we're, measuring our hope by the immediate steps as individuals we can take where we're barking up the wrong tree how i find hope is by finding an excuse to spend time with some of the incredible people in this movement and i'm really fortunate that through the we all network i meet these people all the time whether it's our monthly calls or the talks or we had a face-to-face -face gathering in in glasgow folks who'd come to Glasgow for a COP and it was beautiful because there were about 30 people from the, the big we all community who are in COP all meeting for the first time at, in a beer garden and in a pub, hugging each other, chatting to each other and knowing that they were friends even though they hadn't met because they share that sense of community of being part of this journey of wanting to transform the economic system so that's more humane. And so it's not hard to find hope because there are so many people out there rolling up their sleeves, building the sort of change we need. What also makes me despair though, is just so much the recognition that 
those efforts are still happening despite rather than because of a supportive policy regime idea about what the economy should should be about but you have to make time to hang out with those people other than, otherwise you'll, you you would give up and and you need to nourish yourself with that sense of hope and hanging out with those amazing people who are just despite all the odds starting to build the change already in microcosm so i want to say a huge thank you to our guests ben and catherine for today and for all they're doing to make it a better world Arundhati Roy said, another world is not only possible, she's on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you too to Hannah Johnson, our producer. Please look at our website for lots more information and do please buy both Ben and Catherine's books. Join us next time when we explore compassion with Paul Gilbert and Maria Cantacino. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. Till next time, be useful and kind. Mm -hmm.